everybody, welcome back to the Fired Up with CJ show. We're on part two of talking to Anthony Brinkley, who um, was the Commander Chief Master Sergeant for the 11th Wing of the Joint Base Andrews in Maryland. And he also is uh, the founder of his consulting firm doing leadership coaching consulting called the On the Brink Consulting.com. So welcome back, Anthony. Glad to be here. So in the segment before, you're telling me about your experience as a, a young man um, in being, your parents left you in the hospital, you had to go through a series of chemo. And so did you reconnect with your parents afterwards? Absolutely. After but when I, um, when I say left, you know, I'm, I'm speaking, like, even when I wrote the book, I wrote my book as... I didn't write it as a writer and a, a mature person who is polished in writing. I wrote like when I when, when I wrote when I wrote my book, I wrote as a at the time as a five year old how he would have said it. Mm -hmm. They were saying, um, so I'll give you an example. They said, and I'll answer your question here in a sec. Mm -hmm. They said, Anthony, um, how did you feel when you got left in the hospital? What was wrong with you? And I said, I had tuberculosis, but to me, it was just a big word that meant I couldn't live at home anymore. No. So, so that, that, that was how, so, so when I walk you through the book and different things, I'm at, actually at a certain point, you stop seeing me, and you start seeing things that you can relate to. So to your point, when I came home after six months, they didn't give you therapy back then. And then especially in our community, we were poor and the resources weren't really there. So they just say, Hey, come on back and, um, you know, get back into your life. And when I got home, I was so angry. And I tell people, when you spell anger, A-N-G-E-R, when you don't deal with your anger, then you spell the word danger, D-A-N-G-E-R. Mm. If you don't process your anger, you are very close to a dangerous situation. So I would fight anybody. Mm -hmm. I would sit in a room for hours by myself in the dark. Mm -hmm. And I would just, I was just, because I, I felt like I couldn't trust anyone and I didn't have a, a way to actually process my anger. So although I was surrounded by love, I wasn't embracing love because I was afraid to love because in my mind, love was the thing that caused me to be vulnerable, caused me to be hurt, caused me to have pain. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so my family was always good for me. I just had to learn how to process it. And because we were poor, people were working and they had their issues they were dealing with and just trying to maintain out. So it wasn't like they didn't care. It was like, in some cases, you know, they gave me everything they had. And sometimes you might think, you know, you didn't get something, but it wasn't because someone was holding it back. It might have been because they didn't have it. Mm -hmm. So they didn't, whether it's emotionally or materially, like you could not get what you needed. And they probably didn't know at that time. We just didn't know as much as we know now about sure. attachment, parenting and all of those things. So you came home. Um, from the hospital and an angry man who a little boy who felt abandoned at in first grade you saw two people killed is that right no I, I saw I, I saw one I was walking home from school and I saw a kid get killed in front of me and then I had a gun pulled on me myself my I was in the first grade my brother was in the third grade and um then I saw someone get stabbed as well so, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to make like my stories any hard anyone else, but the point is what people have to understand about trauma is, you know, people think when they say PTSD or you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, things of that nature, they, they, they typically attribute it to people in the military or law enforcement. But what I tell people is the physiological response to trauma is the same regardless of what the stimulus is. So if you were sexually abused or you saw a bad accident or you know, you witness something or, you know, so, so the body, the, the body's response, it doesn't really matter. Well, you don't know what it's like. Yeah. I don't have to know what it's like to be molested, but I know what it's like to go through trauma. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we try to put weight on stuff and we put value on stuff and it's like, no trauma is trauma. Mm. So do you, so when you were writing from your, you know, first grade self or your, you know, your younger self, Mm -hmm. And rewriting this book, what was it like to re-experience or did you re-experience all the traumas that you'd already felt before? I absolutely did. There are people when they read my book, they have to put it down. They start crying because when I was writing my book, it was so visceral for me. 
that I was actually crying while I was writing certain portions of my book. Um, the book, I didn't write the book to, to sell books. I wrote the book because I, I, I'm not convinced I was, I'm an actually, I'm actually an introvert, but, but, but my gifting is an extroversion. So that's why I, tra- that's why I'm a life coach. That's why I, I literally travel around the world. I help NFL players. I help the military. I, I, I help municipalities. So people, because I, I think I'm gifted in this area, people think that I'm an extrovert, but I'm actually an introvert. But I think I may have become an introvert because of my experience. Mm. So, so a lot of times for me, so when I wrote my book, it was a way for me to get stuff off my chest mm. for me. And then some people saw it and then they were like, wow, this is good. This, you know, this helped me. And mm. so then I turned it into a book. How did it help other people? How did reading your story help other people? Okay. So when I, when I, I'll give you an example, we've all, all of us have dealt with loss. All of us have dealt with separation. All of us have left, dealt with um, betrayal in some form. So I talk about my experiences. So I will, I introduce the concepts, those concepts through me. So I'll give you a story like my uncle, um, he died and he was, um, I probably was about 23 and I, I saw him in the hospital and I knew it was the last time I was ever going to see him alive. And I tell the story in the book about how I went to encourage him. And then he was telling me, you got to run your race. And he subordinated his pain and his suffering to try to give me one last life lesson. Hmm. And, and as I was telling that story and he was talking about love, he said, you're afraid to love. But he said, he asked me to close my eyes. He said, what do you hear? What do you feel? I said, I hear birds. He said, do you realize the average bird eats two and a half times his body weight every day? And he said, when a bird a bird sings, because when it's, when it's ready to eat, God is going to provide for it. He said, do you hear kids playing? He said, yeah. He said, when you give up your fear of, of touching and connecting, you can get your joy back. And the same God that let those kids play loves you. So he walked me down this, this path mm. of introspection and reflection. And he said, he said, I'm going to give you something, but you don't owe me anything else, but to pass it on to somebody else. So when I was telling the story about what true love was through vulnerability, it helped people deal with their lack of forgiveness, their lack of empathy, their lack of understanding. So there, there are concepts in the book. That's why I call the book. You can't run away from you a young man's journey to himself. When you look at the book, you're going to stop seeing me and you're going to start seeing yourself. Mm. Are there people you haven't forgiven? Are, are, are there things you say you, you, you've gone through this, but you harbor, you have a callus on your heart because of some person, what they did in your life, but you don't realize the people that you love the most, they don't get your whole heart because part of it is calloused. Mm-hmm. So you're actually hurting yourself. So I challenge people to look at themselves through my eyes and eventually they start seeing themselves through my experiences. Mm. And so what are the, um, what do you hear back from other people when they actually are living their experience through your story? What are you hearing as some of the healing that happens afterwards? Just because part of it is being aware that you actually have, haven't forgiven that you've had calluses on your heart, um, that you're scared or feel abandoned. Like all those things require a huge amount of awareness. But even once you gain that awareness, it's almost like you, the, if the calluses start rubbing off, there's this kind of tender young skin underneath and, and how to deal with it, even if you're aware of it. So what has been the experience and have, how have people learned to deal with the pain? So what I tell people is this, I just taught a session, a four hours a session yesterday in Alabama. And I tell people in life, you can't address what you haven't acknowledged. And so in many cases, we keep repeating cycles and things in our lives because we haven't acknowledged the symptomatic elements that cause us to do those things. We just react versus reflect and respond. Mm-hmm. So, so for me, um, when I, when I write this, when I write and, and back to your analogy about the scab, the beautiful thing about a scab or a scar is it represents knowledge, insight, perspective, experience. And even if you, if, even if it becomes raw again, the beauty of the rawness is you can feel again. Mm. 
Mm. When the scab is there, to your example, you can't feel. Mm -hmm. But when you expose it again, you say, I'm willing. The thing about love that, that people get out of my book, the lessons, one of them is that um, you have to be vulnerable, but you have to trust your heart and your, your experience and your life with someone who will protect your vulnerability. Mm. And so, mm. so many times what I get from people, so I tell a story about, I, I had issues with my father, God rest his soul, because he was in and out of my life at critical times. And I used to tell people my father was dead. I wrote about this. Mm. And they said, and they said, um, and many people didn't know my father was dead because I told them they believed me. And I said, it was easier to, 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 to establish the whereabouts of a dead father than someone that you didn't know what, what they were doing. Mm. But I wrote this in the book. I said, although I tried to kill my father with my words, my heart wouldn't let him die. Mm. And so what I found out later in life was my father gave me everything that he had, but I didn't know something. I was ignorant to this fact that my father was the baby of three boys. My grandmother, his mother was like, you know, what are you on for dessert? So she get one chocolate cake, one sweet potato pie, one apple pie. And he was the baby. So he got everything he wanted. He came home one day from school at the age of 13 and his mother had a stroke and died in his arms. Oh. He never knew his father. So the oh, most fun man. foundational figure in his life died in his life at the age of 13. And I'm at a, and I'm trying to figure out, God, dad, why don't you say you love me? Why don't you hug me? It's like, he, he, that wasn't, he, he, his love language was different. So he actually expressed love to me, but through my ignorance and lack of knowledge and being able to pick up, I didn't recognize his love. I'm grateful that before he died, we were able to reconcile. So when people read the book mm. every day in America, 7,000 people die. So one of the things that I try to do with my writing is to challenge people to not act like you have more time to make something right. Mm. Not, if you have the ability to take weight off of somebody because you're giving them, you know, they're carrying your weight of unforgiveness, uh, take that weight off of them because you don't know why they did what they did. And oh, by the way, as you've heard it said, unforgiveness is really you hurt yourself more. It's like you drink poison, but you hope the other person die. Mm -hmm. So you have to get that out of you so you can be the best version of yourself. Mm. And how did you reconcile it with your dad? So... My faith was really important to me and I got licensed and ordained in ministry. So I have a lot of different credentials and different things. And then when my faith, when God opened that door, I was traveling around the world preaching to people. And I said, wow, if my dad died today, I don't know what, where he would go. So one day I got in my car and I drove to North Carolina and I sat in the house with him. And my father went through a lot. He was a fighter. He had like three strokes. I mean, wow. he had like a heart of, you know, just, just a strong man. And I think that's what got me through some of this. That's how Joanne Bass got through hers and, and you know, CQ Brown. And so one day I said, how can I tell people about this guy that I love who forgave me? And I, I got unforgiveness about my dad. And mm -hmm. so one day in a nondescript house in the middle of Dunn, North Carolina, little town, um, I sat next to him and we talked and we prayed. And we and we 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 forgave each other, and, and there was no explanations needed. And when he died, I actually eulogized my dad. No, wow. What? Um, how do you feel about the whole thing now? Now that you, you know, what you're saying is that you it, there's there's no time but now to go back and tell those people that you have not forgiven that you forgive them or vice versa, ask for forgiveness. Cause sometimes you're on the other side of the equation, right? You've done something and you feel so horrible about it and you don't know what to do. Um, how did you even structure that conversation and what happens now as a result of having that all resolved? I knew in, in reflection, you know, there, there's, there's, there's hindsight where you look at what you went through and you kind of glean perspective from it, which leads to insight. So, and then that insight can actually lead to foresight where you can anticipate how to move forward and, and maybe mitigate or eliminate things that you will go through. And I realized that um, because of my pain and because of my dad's pain, my dad didn't know how to say, I love you. 
he he was afraid because the most foundational figure in his life died in front of him and it literally mm. literally in his arms mm. so he was afraid to tell me he loved you know when he got before he died he was saying and he got emotional he cried and um he said what is this what's this salty discharge coming out of my eyes they're called <laughs> tears dad that's what they are they can be tears of joy and so Mm. So what I what I what I what I try to challenge people to do through my life and my experiences is that to understand that you know you wasting a lot of time and a lot of years and a lot of opportunities. That's why if you go to um, funerals, like in my community, when someone passes away and we believe they're going home with the Lord, we call it home goings. Mm. But if you don't know God. And you know, you, you haven't taken out two, those are funerals because that's where there's lack, there's was a regret. And you'll mm-hmm. see people at funerals literally hanging on the casket because they have regret of what they didn't do and mm-hmm. opportunities they let pass. Mm-hmm. When you make your life about, see, pain is like this. Pain is like a propellant. Pain, pain is gonna, it's gonna either move, it's gonna move you in one direction or another. Pain is like an open container of gasoline. If you don't protect it and, and deal with it the right way, you put a you put a you know a, a spark on it will burn up everything that's by it. Or you can use pain as an accelerant to move you. So pain can be instructive. It tells you where you need to pay attention. When your elbow hurts, it means you should pay attention to your elbow. If you pay attention to your pain, it can instruct you. If you ignore your pain, it can destroy you. And that's what mo- that's why Americans make up five percent of the world's population, yet Americans consume eighty five percent of all the prescription drugs in the world. Mm-hmm. We have taught Americans that when you when things get hard and gets painful, take a pill, mm-hmm. take a drink, take a drug, ignore it, and that's why people get depressed. That's why they commit suicide because we tell them to let pain let it become your tormentor versus let pain become your mentor. Mm -hmm. Wow, beautiful. Um, What I want to do is in the next segment, talk about, um, you say that you coach a lot of young men, and, um, and I assume it's how to deal with some of this pain. So I want to talk to you a little bit worries about um, the work that you've done, leading and coaching and helping young men um, move forward and to propel their life forward versus being um, having the pain consume them. Um, we have been talking to Anthony Brinkley about his book, um, You Can't Run Away From You, A Young Man's Journey to Himself. Thank you so much. You're welcome.